Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to the third annual Inclusive Education Showcase. I'm Terry Cumming, and I'm a professor of special education from the School of Education. I'm also a Scientia Education Academy fellow, and I am the academic lead education at the UNSW Disability Innovation Institute, who are the host of the showcase today. The Institute is a world first initiative that harnesses inclusive and interdisciplinary research and education alongside people with disability to seek innovation solutions that are meaningful to people with disability. Before we get started, I would like to show my respect to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I currently reside and from where I'm coming to you right now. I acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people, the first Australians, whose lands, winds, and waters we now all share, and I pay respect to their unique values and their continuing and enduring cultures, which deepen and enrich the life of our nation and communities. I would also like to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who may be present here today, noting, of course, that their sovereignty over this land was never ceded. I encourage you all to also acknowledge the land on which you're attending this showcase in the chat. Today, we're lucky enough to hear from some of UNSW's top flight educators, all of whom truly embody the principle of inclusive education in their practice. This is one of my very favorite events every year because it's so great to see what my colleagues are doing in this area. Um, you will all have the opportunity to ask questions at the end when everyone's finished, but as you think of them, feel free to pop them in the chat and we'll go back to them at the end when everyone's finished speaking. Now to get us started, we have a presentation focused on student educator collaboration that's centered on listening to student voices to improve our courses and the university experience for neurodivergent students. While I will be leading off the presentation, it is my pleasure to introduce my colleagues and co-founders of the Diversify Group, Erin St. James Bugie, a UNSW student who's studying advanced, who's studying an advanced Bachelor of Science majoring in molecular biology, and Associate Professor Ian MacArthur from the UNSW Art and Design. Okay, so um, hi everyone. Uh, thank, thank you very much for inviting us, uh, Terry. I uh, re really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and, and Aaron, I think I saw you there. So um, let's, let's do this. Um, okay, I'll just share my screen. Okay, so hopefully you can uh, see um, my slides, that hopefully that's working. Um, and um, yeah, thank, thanks for the opportunity to present um, the Diversified Project at this Inclusive Education Showcase. Of course, I want to begin, or we, we both want to begin by acknowledging that our presentation was jointly produced by myself uh, on the beautiful traditional lands of the Darug and Gundungurra people, where I am now, where I live. Um, and Aaron um, and Professor uh, Terry Cumming, both on the lands of the Bijgul and Gadigal peoples uh, of the Eora Nation. And we pay our deep respect to elders past, present and emerging, noting, of course, that sovereignty over this land was never ceded. Now, our, our presentation today um, will, of course, just briefly, uh, because of time, discuss these following topics. The student voice, which is so critical to... Uh, the Diversify project, talk a little bit about um, you know, what we've achieved so far, and then um, going to look at some of the recommendations that have emerged from a series of workshops um, that um, the Diversify group held. Um, hopefully that's going to raise some critical questions, and it'd be great to see some, um, some questions uh, in the chat. All right, so um, I'm going to start with this quote, which was contributed by Aaron, in fact, much earlier in our ongoing many conversations that we've had uh, with the Diversified Group. And 
you know, it seems obvious, but but in practice, <clears throat> weren't that, you know, in, in fact, it, it's not so obvious. And um, so in the student-led spirit of how the Diversified Project started and how it continues, I'm, I'm going to hand over to Aaron to take the lead. And Aaron, I'll just change the slides when you uh, let me know you want me to change the slides. Great. Thanks, Anne. Okay, uh, so during our first online diversified presentation, uh, Josie, who was my co-student lead and myself, uh, shared our experiences uh, of our coursework at UNSW. Um, and with doing this, we had many uh, students openly engage in a free flowing conversation that created a sense of togetherness and camaraderie. And since we got these welcoming and honest responses from new diverse students during the workshops, uh, or during the online presentation, we decided to run the workshops in a similar manner. And by doing this, we created a safe space for participants to openly discuss and problem solve their course related problems in a co productive manner. Uh, so, the biggest standout for me during these workshops was when other neurodiverse students expressed their gratitude for finally feeling like their voices matter and that their concerns were finally being heard and that action was being taken to improve neurodiverse students' accessibility to their coursework. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, inviting feedback from university students does not guarantee that they will feel heard. Just as defining our campus administrative facilities online does not guarantee that students will know how to contact or who to contact if a concern arises. So these realities pose difficulties for UNSW finance models, which rely on contented students who stay and finish their degrees. So now I've provided some thought-provoking questions just to stimulate everybody's minds. Um, okay, so students invest in UNSW and academics by paying their tuition fees, but how are academics reciprocating this by investing in their students so they feel heard and acknowledged? Another one is, uh, uh, what are you currently doing to make students feel heard and acknowledged? Um, another one is, uh, what's one small accessibility improvement you could make to ensure neurodiverse students have equal opportunity to learn from their courses? Another is, uh, what do you think the Diversified Project did that is different to the current university uh, survey SAS feedback systems uh, due to the neurodiverse students' feedback we mentioned, I just mentioned previously? Uh, next slide, please. Um, some more questions. Uh, so why do you think the current UNSW systems have not adequately provided neurodiverse students with a sense of being heard and seen? Another one is, uh, why do you think neurodiverse students felt like no action had been taken for the inaccessibility issues they faced before the diversified workshops? And last thought provoking question I have for everybody is uh, how can we amplify the diversified projects methods so that we can raise more awareness about neurodiverse students needs. And so that a larger neurodiverse student cohort can feel heard and seen. Um, I hope that stimulated everybody's brains a little bit. Um, okay, next slide please. Yep, that's there. Yeah, okay. So so I put this slide here as I wanted to emphasize the amount of personal and academic growth I've had after having my course related problems heard and after and having um sorry and having heard other neurodiverse students' voices being expressed during their work, the diversified workshops. Um, so this experience has opened up my passion for neurodiverse accessibility advocacy and it's encouraged me to take on multiple casual paid roles at UNSW and several other volunteering positions. Um, so I never expected to see myself capable of any of these roles before the diversified workshops. And, um, and if this has helped me so much, I'm, I can only imagine what it could do for many more neurodiverse students who start to feel like heard and acknowledged. Okay, so now I'm going to pass it over to Ian, who will explain the Diversified Project's aims, methods, and recommendations. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your time. Thanks so much, Aaron. That's, that was great, man. Um, okay, so the, the three primary aims you can see on the, the screen, um, and I, I think they are and they appear to be quite clear and simple, but I, I also think they have big implications. Um, diversified has exemplified what a, a, a kind of process that, that I describe as intra-action, the creation of emergent knowledge between different groups of people 
to trigger and take advantage of, and in our case, uh, with diversified, the synergies emerging from the combined intelligences and experiences of neurodivergent and neurotypical actors at UNSW. However, um, that said, for me at least, from the outset as an academic, this has required quite an acknowledgement of, of our collective and my own kind of uh, individual unknowingness. And um, it's kind of required a, a kind of willingness to unlearn. Um, because I think that co-design and co-production, which is the ethos of di diversified, historically, I, I think academics and you know, not, not the least design academics like myself, we've struggled in co-design scenarios to really seed our control of the process and allow the participants, the co-producers, in our case, again, neurodivergent students, to, to give them the control that would actually be meaningful and lead to change in, a, you know, in relation to a, the particular problems that they face, sets of relationships that are in play, you know, and the situations that they encounter. And so um, I, I think this has been a key goal of Diversify, to create that possibility. Um, here's, here's a map of, of where we've come from so far. Initially, I was going to run through each, each phase, but I, I actually decided that to, to note that our workshops were attended by neurodiverse students and neurodiverse and neurotypical teaching and professional staff, but to also go on to say that educational co-design and co-production that is truly inclusive of all ways of being and learning require us academics to unlearn and relearn, to, to hear and experience the perspectives and experiences of students. And in these workshops, it's been very much a process of hearing that in the moment. And I think a great example of this is our first diversified workshop where the group of participants did not adhere to or were not willing to adhere to our pre-planned process. And by upending the structure and planning that we had there, we reached a new place with new ideas that we may never have arrived at if we'd have kept within the lines you know, that we'd drawn to work within. And I, I think this is perhaps at least somewhat at odds with much of our more fixed theoretical understandings of uh, you know, what education is. So in a sense, at least for the neurotypical participants, other perspectives that we hadn't necessarily considered came into view over the three workshops. And in doing so, this created imperatives for considerations on the part of academics. Uh, which which kind of brings us to the recommendations. Now, there are quite a list of recommendations. I don't have time or we don't have time to, to kind of go through them. Um, but um, the following is a summary of the recommendations emerging from, from the three workshops. We've all, we organized them into four key themes that emerged. Um, administration processes, spaces, which refer to environments, buildings, infrastructure, facilities, technology, et cetera, um, student identity and culture, and really importantly, staff and academic uh, culture. And then those recommendations were further grouped into actions that could or should be taken at UNSW at the systemic level, the faculty and school level, and the course and instructor level. So my earlier reflections notwithstanding, many of the recommendations participants identified oh. are what I'd simply describe as best practice in teaching. Um, <clears throat> although, although I think, you know, in, in terms of spaces, you know, the recommendations here are, are perhaps um, considerations we might not typically take into account. Um, yeah, and so student identity and culture, um, making uh, more kind of synergies and collaboration across faculties was really important because there's so many different kind of ways of approaching um, you know, inclusive teaching and uh, services in different faculties, different supports, different expectations and processes. Um, and... Um, 
the staff and academic culture. I, I think that, that this is probably the really critical group of recommendations. Um, climate setting at the beginning of courses was a big topic and uh, also was designing in greater flexibility around assessment processes. Um, and I, I think that the issue of flexibility is so important. I'd note that TAFE, for example, has had flexible delivery in place since the 1990s. So it's possible if the will is there. Um, so I, I think my earlier reflective comments were very much about academic culture. And this was a big concern for neurodiverse participants looking at these recommendations. I'd simply have to reiterate that all or at least many are indicators of high quality, inclusive and reflective teaching practice. Now, it could go on, but I'm aware of time. So um, thanks for your attention. Um, also, just finally, I'm going to put a couple of links in the chat uh, about some of the things that uh, we've produced. So I'll stop sharing now. Thank you so much, Ian and Aaron. It's been a pleasure to go, go down this road with you on this journey, and it's exciting that we're getting to share it with everybody today. Okay, next I would like to introduce Scott Brown. Scott's a lecturer at UNSW Sydney, where you can find him leading the assistive technology focus of the Creative Robotics Lab and teaching interaction design and UX. He works alongside neurodivergent people, developing experience that enrich the lives of those often marginalized by emerging technologies. Scott advocates first-person experiences, knowledge, and values of neurodivergent people as central to the design process. He will be discussing the autism-friendly campus project, the first of its kind in Australia, which aims to make the UNSW Paddington campus more welcoming and inclusive of all neurodivergent students, staff, and visitors to our campus. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, let's see if I can share my screen here. That's perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, so it's appropriate then that I start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that I'm speaking to you from today, the Gadigal people, um, the Paddington campus, sometimes called the creative campus of UNSW, has long been a, a place of uh, creating uh, far before there was uh, UNSW on these lands. This project um, was supported by a small grant from the Division of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion um, and is a close collaboration with Autism Spectrum Australia. So just wanted to acknowledge their um, role in the project. And this is the team, the main team of the project. Um, Tom Tutton is the uh, manager of Aspect Practice and the amazing Matthew and Emma who um, really drove this project from the perspective of people with lived experience. So I'll talk a little bit about their roles. Um, and interestingly enough, we also have an art and design art and design alumni, Rebecca Street, who's part of the autism friendly team as well. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about my background to give, I guess, the project some context. Um, as Terry said, I have a role in the Creative Robotics Lab where I lead assistive technologies. And a lot of my research is with um, neurodivergent and people with a disability. And I think very early on in my research practice, um, I, I had the, the fortune, I suppose, of working with um, people with lived experience who taught me a lot about how important that is in the design process. It, it shaped my language, it shaped my thinking. So a lot of this comes from um, that background and I guess my, my efforts to create space for people with lived experience. Um, I recognize that I'm a neurotypical able-bodied person. And I think it's quite important that um, I use the privilege that I have to create spaces for people to um, do their best work. and and when I look at the great stuff being done with Diversified, I think this is probably the other side of the coin. Um, I'm not so much looking at what's happening in the classroom. I'm looking at how can we 
create a campus that is welcoming, inclusive for all neurodivergent and all people really, whether they're staff, students or visitors. Um, and, and really just how can we get out of the way? How can we make those things easier, um, more welcoming and, and, and accepting of people's different ways of being in the world? This is a quote that I often introduce to my design students when we start talking about empathy, and that happens a lot in design. We, we, we try to empathise with users. But I think this, this great quote from Mike Montero kind of gets to the heart of some of the, the dangers of, of saying the right words but not taking the right actions. Um, so I'm just going to read this out. What about empathy? Empathy is a pretty word for exclusion. I've seen all male, all white teams taking empathy workshops to see how women think. If you want to know how women would use something you're designing, get a woman on your design team. They're not extinct. We don't need to study them. We can hire them. So obviously he's talking about um, the problem of, of white guys designing for women, in, but it, this applies equally for, I think, a lot of the history of how we've thought about designing for people with a disability or for neurodiversity. Um, it's not enough to say that we empathise with people. We want those people in the room with us. We want, that, we want to hear their, their values, their understanding of the world and their experience, and we want that to drive the design process, whether that's in the classroom or in research. So just broadly, these are the project goals for the Autism Friendly Campus. Um, I collaborated with the Autism Friendly team at Autism Spectrum Australia to come in and do an, uh, what they call an Autism Friendly Assessment of our Paddington campus. Um, alongside this, we looked at how we can train our staff to better support neurodivergent students and visitors to campus, and then start looking at what environmental changes can we make, uh, what resources can we develop that make art and design a school of choice for neurodiverse people. So we want, we want this to be something that we can promote and show that we want neurodivergent people to be joining us here on campus. So this is when Matt and Anna came to, uh, Matt and, um, uh, Emma, sorry, came to our Paddington campus to do an assessment. They did this over a couple of days and looked at what was already working well and what perhaps we could improve. Um, we had a lot of great discussions, particularly with our Making Centre staff and our ARC staff who are already doing some really good things and I'll, I'll point to those in a minute. Um, here on our campus, we have a lot of making going on that can be sensorily problematic, it can be loud, it can have strong smells, those sorts of things. So this, these were the sorts of spaces that we we're particularly interested in, um, understanding uh, how we could uh, work around existing um, issues and processes to allow more people to use those spaces in a way that makes sense for them. The autism friendly framework is something that's not just being done here at, at Paddington. Um, the Aspect team have been going across the country doing assessments of all sorts of environments. Um, you can see here just a few people they've worked with. So it's not just about education or therapy. Um, it's about um, how can we allow neurodiverse people to come and, and, and experience anything in the way that makes sense for them. The Autism Friendly Framework has uh, seven key points. So I'll, I'll kind of dash through, the, through these quickly. I'll go into them in more detail when I speak about the, the positives and the recommendations that came out of the report. Um, but what they're looking for is a culture of inclusion, preparation and pre predictability. It's quite a big one for uh, people who perhaps haven't been to our campus before and not sure what to expect. Structure and visual organisation. Sensory adaptations. Um, again, important here at Paddington. Communication supports, proactive problem solving and participation and feedback. So after uh, Matt and Emma came uh, to campus and we had a lot of really interesting discussions about um, what they saw and, and um, what perhaps they didn't get an opportunity to see because um, we wanted to also get some input from people who had been here on campus and we were really, really lucky the first day that um, Matt and Emma were here 
Aaron and Josie were also here with us and came around campus with us and had some really interesting insights from the perspective of, of students. So those sorts of discussions also helped us frame the report. Um, I'll just note that the report is almost done and I'll be able to share this with everybody in the coming weeks. So I'm just taking a couple of, uh, I suppose, interesting points out of each section of the report. Um, ARC is clearly doing really great work. Um, they're really, Aspect are really impressed with the way that ARC supports students in all sorts of ways. Um, the UNSW website is doing better around um, outlining supports available for students. There's still some work to be done. Um, recommendations here on Paddington was we're lacking a quiet space. It's a small campus, we have limited space. Um, that's, a, that's an ongoing discussion. Um, but they also suggested bringing a statement of inclusion into classes, which I will show you an example of um, in a moment. Around preparation and predictability, um, the Making Centre, again, doing great work around uh, explaining expectations and processes to students with their inductions, uh, tours, those sorts of things. Uh, equitable learning, also doing um, some good work, showing students what's available to them, information is laid out logically. Um, but what was recommended here was some, some key resources that we can bring to our website in particular. I've developed a visual story, um, which I'll show you shortly. And the Making Centre staff have started introducing colour-coded uh, logos, I suppose, to, to make the spaces and the staff more easily identifiable. And I'll show you the examples of those as well. Um, our structure and visual organisation. Um, there's some new signage and wayfinding signage here on campus, which is, is doing quite a good job. Um, the one that always trips people up, though, is the elevators. I think universally that they're, they're, they're an interestingly badly designed um, interaction space, um, and we can do better with, with labelling um, in that, that um, environment. Uh, sensory adaptations, uh, we're quite lucky here at Paddington to be surrounded by a lot of beautiful trees and spaces and, and some of the rooms here take advantage of the natural light there. Um, but there is also, I think this is a, a broad problem across the university, some old uh, lighting that, that could be um, improved by using dimmable LEDs, uh, consistency across rooms, so you're not moving from a dark space to a bright space and so on. Um, and a little bit of a, a classic one, we should look at uh, perhaps adding paper towels to toilets so we're not dealing with the uh, extreme sound of, of um, automatic hand dryers. Um, Communication supports is a little outside the scope of this project, so there's not a lot of detail here, but the Diverse Up 5 project was identified as, as doing some amazing work, um, but we could probably look at, at training our staff a little bit better to um, understand different modes of communication, perhaps AAC, Auslan, and so on. Proactive problem solving. Um, the safe operating procedures uh, are generally well organized. There's improvements coming there through the Making Center staff. Um, something that we have introduced here, though, is the hidden disability sunflower training, which I'll talk about in more detail in a moment. Uh, our staff training. We have a lot of staff here at Paddington who have taken up the mental health first aid and um, ally training, which is great. Um, what we could be doing more of, though, is making sure all of our training is delivered by the people um, from that community. So I think allied training does quite well in this space, but we could also look at um, bringing neurodivergent people in to um, ex run workshops around neurodiversity and autism. Um, and that's something that we're looking at with Aspect in the new year. All right. So... These are the resources developed to this point from the project. This is an example of a statement of inclusion that I've started introducing in, in all my Moodle sites in uh, the first, one of the first slides in, in uh, the weekly lectures in every course. Um, 
And basically it is an acknowledgement that everybody can reach out if they need additional help in a way that makes sense for them. So just opening that door and saying, we know that some people might have different needs. If there's anything we can help with, please do that. A lot of students don't feel as though they're able to, to ask that question. So just making that statement, I think helps. Here's a few pages from the visual story, which is going to go on the art and design website. So it's an easy read um, document that is, is really just laying out the key um, expectations around campus. So this is something called the hidden curriculum aspect, we call it. So all of those things that we kind of take for granted, we know all those uh, like expectations because we've been here um, on campus for a long time. It's not always obvious for new people to camp to campus. So there's a document here for them where they can look at, where can I go if I have questions? How do I find my way around? What are the accessibility um, resources available to me? Where can I eat food? And it's it, it's just laid out very clearly with images. So um, there's nothing new or unexpected as much as possible. These are the Making Center logos that I referenced earlier. Uh, Karam, the manager of the Making Center, has done some really great work here. Um, so each making space has a different color code. Uh, we have the Resor AV Resource Center, printmaking, screen printing, the tool room, textiles and jewelry here. Um, and a lot of the staff working, the professional staff working in these spaces also have the same logo um, on a shirt or a or an apron or whatever they, they work in. So they're more easily identified by students. Um, we've developed a new accessibility map to campus. So the one on the left is our existing map. Um, it's, there's a lot of information there. A lot of it's not necessary. So this was kind of about stripping that back and highlighting some, some key features. So here at Paddington, the main entrance is not accessible. Uh, if you go to, to where you're directed, which is the number one entrance, you'll find a lot of stairs there. It's gates three and six, which are accessible. So we've, we've laid that out a bit more clearly, um, highlighted all gender toilets and just stripped back any information that's perhaps not as important. I pulled this across into sensory maps as well. So this is still something I'm working on. It's a pretty big project. It's uh, part of the assessment of campus was to look at where these sensory things are taking place. A lot of it happens in workshops. So just um, identifying where you might encounter loud, bright, strong smells, intense colors, those sorts of things. So um, anybody who might have difficulty with some of those um, sensors can avoid those spaces or just think about um, other places on campus they might like to remove themselves to if they are feeling overwhelmed. Um, on that point, we're in the process of putting together a sensory garden. Claire Millage is doing some great stuff on campus with a gar our small but beautiful gardens. Uh, and there's this one between a, a G and A block that she's called the secret garden, where we're bringing some sensory experiences in. And it's a nice uh, space where people can feel surprisingly removed from the rest of campus. Um, and finally, the hidden disability training. So there is now available to all Paddington staff uh, a Moodle module where um, they can go through the hidden disabilities sunflower scheme training. Um, if you're not familiar with this, the sunflower scheme has been around for quite a while. It's it's been in the UK since I think about 2016. It's now picking up in Australia. People with a hidden disability, and that could be an autistic person, it could be somebody with anxiety, um, it could be anything that's not presenting in an obvious visual way, can wear the sunflower to uh, highlight that they may need a little bit more time, a little bit more support, a little bit of help. Um, and so our staff uh, are being made aware of that. Those lanyards are available for free for our students on campus. Um, and on the left, there's a little supporter badge. So all of our staff who take part in the training get a badge to say they support the Sunflower. And so they can also be identified by, by students who might feel as though they need to reach out for a little bit more help. Um, so next steps. We are going to be doing some training by the Autism Friendly Team to Paddington staff in the new year. Um, I'm speaking with the galleries 
staff about doing sensory friendly tours as part of our annual exhibition, student exhibition in December. And we're looking for ways to keep this conversation going with, with neurodivergent students. So if there's anybody in the room who would like to collaborate on this project or has any thoughts, please feel free to reach out to me. Thanks. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Scott. I am loving so much of that. I have questions for you at question time, but I will wait. Um, the one comment I do want to make, though, is it's so easy to see how the things you're doing, kind of the same as when we do universal design, whether it's in architecture or education, how it benefits everybody, not just the neurodivergent students that it's meant for. So thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have one of my very close colleagues who I work on a number of pro projects with. We kept finding ourselves in the same meetings all the time. Um, Karen Chris is a lecturer at UNSW Art and Design with the Media Arts, Motion Capture and Animation and Moving Image Areas. She's a disability champion for ADA and a disability advisor for art and design. Karen's going to talk about her two projects in Vivid 2019 and Vivid 2022 in collaboration with artists living with disability. Turn it over to you, Karen. Thank you, Terry, and thanks for thank you for asking me to speak today. Can everybody hear and see me okay? It's awkward when you can only see your slides and you can't see anybody. <laughs> um, okay, so like Terry said, I'll just talk through a couple of my projects that. I worked on uh, two large scale 3D animated works for Vivid in 2019 and 2022. So here, here is um, the artist that I worked with on in 2019 with the work behind us there. Uh, so this was in collaboration with um, research partners as well. Hang on, I'm having trouble moving my slides. There we go. Uh, called the Junction Works Limited. So they're a disability provided located across Southwest Sydney. Uh, but most importantly, co-creation with my, with um, nine other artists living with disability. Uh, I also identify as, as having lived experience. Um, so I just I want to really acknowledge these artists uh, for their uh, creative um, genius and their integrity, their creative integrity. Uh, as out without these artists, I could not have completed these projects. Uh, that they they are the creative force behind both the projects, and it's really important to acknowledge them. Uh, their names are Tommy Dung, Michaela Rolls, Peter Pang, Dominic Laguti, Tao Fan, Michael Tran, Melissa Morrison, Rahul Parmesh, and uh, Teresa Sarevi. Uh, and we also collaborated with two sound artists, Luke Killen and Ant Bannister, who created the sound components of the two works. Uh, another component of those. Vivid projects was we worked with students from art and design as part of the professional experience placement, which is essentially a part of their degree. Uh, the students do 150 hours of work on real projects. Uh, and so um, we worked, here's uh, three of them at the uh, latest Crowded Cadman's exhibition from Vivid 2022. Uh, and uh, some of the, these students have actually gone on to work in the industry as a result of having these projects on their CV, which was fantastic. So I'll show you a little bit of the work here. So we'll just turn the sound off there just because we don't have much time. I can't really show you the whole piece. It goes for about nearly four minutes. Uh, so this work was the first Vivid that we worked on, which was in 2019 called Dream States. You could see in that first piece, it was like an unusual shaped building that's called the Bird's Mouth. And that's on the side of the International Convention Center in Sydney. This particular wall is just to the right of that, also on the convention center. And this is sort of opposite Tumbalong Park. Uh, and also 
these individual um, characters that the artists created were also along sort of 19 screens leading down Tumbalong Boulevard to Darling Harbour, so individual characters. You can see Betty Berger, Gadgetron, um, and so on. Uh, Betty Berger has paintbrush legs, which is pretty cool. Uh, I just, I'll let you um, hear some of the crowd interaction, see and hear the crowd interaction. <laughs> As you can see and hear from that, it's quite it, it made the space quite activated. It was quite an active space. <laughs> uh, so here's the original collage that um, Tommy Dawn created from um, a whole collection of, of different images. And this is the 3D uh, model that we created or anima an animation. And this is actually on one of those 19 screens along Tumbalong Boulevard. Uh, so Tommy named that particular work Specimen 44. Uh, this is Michaela Rolls' Betty Berger, as you can see the paintbrush, paintbrush legs here. Uh, Michaela, throughout the creative process, uh, working with the students, made a decision to take away the uh, money notes that you can see there. This was also on one of the 19 screens along the boulevard. So Betty Berger, pretty cool. So leading up to the Vivid projects, we didn't really start with the Vivid, Vivid projects. We started a lot smaller and in, in, in quite a different space. So, so there were a few trials and lots of other works. And you can see one of the works here on the left here, um, utilizing motion capture. We use that as a kind of an exploratory creative tool um, for the artists. Uh, this particular work was live streamed uh, during an event. Um, performed alongside a choir singing at an event called the All-Stars at the Kasula Powerhouse. You can see uh, Ben's there, uh, you know, it's like a virtual production pipeline for anybody that knows that process is driving the, the particles in real time. And Ben designed the, the artwork. So we also were able to um, later on create a project with Ben uh, and, and other artists with a character. So Ben was, you know, in that motion capture suit driving a character um, and it was shown at the annual National Disability Festival called Spark. And this enabled us to trial sort of working with um, the group more on motion capture as a creative tool. And that this particular system, so this particular motion capture system you can see um, that has the markers on it, uh, also enabled the audience and other, um, so the audience was more people living with disability and other artists to engage in wider discussion about the possibilities of this technology and animation. So it really enabled uh, lots of uh, openings for us in terms of uh, the way we worked. Uh, we later used motion capture quite critically for each of the Vivid works. Um, so it was a really important tool for the artists they really wanted to create the work within the motion capture studio because they were able to really determine what the characters did and how they interacted. Uh, so a really great storytelling and previous tool for the work. So for the weekly workshops, we, uh, we use aspects of UDL, Universal Design for Learning, lots of different approaches, also evidence-based processes such as te um, technology-aided instruction, intervention, video modeling and prompting and so on. Um, the artists use iPads and computers that they were quite familiar with, uh, that they were using at home and you know, in their everyday, uh, but the artists weren't necessarily trained in any animation or graphic software. Um, they used, you know, some use iPads, some use computers, uh, but most of them actually preferred the sort of lo-fi methods like pencil um, and more prominently we used collage, which became um, quite an important tool. Uh, collage was really effective because it meant the artist could focus on story and the narrative rather than worrying about their skills in drawing or the iPads or whatever. Um, so at times collage helped us to develop the characters for Vivid, but uh, 
At other times, it was actually just a meditative process or um, which enabled discussion and community building within the group. So it became quite a familiar process that the artists would come back to. Uh, so the collage works that the artists used to create the characters went to be exhibited at Bega Valley Regional Gallery, which is, um, you can see the image here, and um, in an exhibition called Dream States Come True. This also opened up a unique opportunity for us to re-exhibit Dream States again, which was reconformed and reanimated as Dream States version 2.0, uh, another large scale pro projection on the side of the Beaker Valley Regional Gallery and Town Chambers for the Festival of Open Minds and Park Lights 2019. And the artists were able to attend both of the events, uh, open in the ex exhibition with the local member for parliament. And they were also involved in a radio interview on the ABC regional radio station, further opening avenues for the group as working artists. So some great outcomes and exciting things happened there. So this year we were uh, lucky to exhibit uh, Vivid in Vivid again uh, with a completely different project called Crowd Cadmans. Uh, we, uh, it took a couple of years. So Vivid was canceled in 2020, uh, sorry, 2020, 2021. And then finally the work was exhibited in 2022. So there was lots of things that happened between um, in those years, uh, but um, for example, we had works that or, or tests that we did that were never shown. So this is an example of, of you know, something that happened that was never shown on, on the work. We had to run our workshops uh, on Zoom. So you can see me having lots of fun with my group uh, in, with, on, with the online Zoom workshops. We'd run those every week. And this was an important, uh, this was an important for wellbeing for the community as much as it was for completing the project. So here is uh, the, one of the artists, Tao, and her collage work uh, of Pinky Moon. You can see Pinky Moon here with the moon with the pink striped legs. And this is uh, Pinky Moon as a fully modeled and textured character, which went into the final piece here. And if you see me play that, you can actually see what it's constructed of the polygons. So this is what we call a turntable. So that's Pinky Moon. Um, this is Jessica, the astro astronaut, created by Michaela. So you can see the collage on the left here and the 3D model on the right here. So in in the um, inside the in, well within the process of creating it, we actually got rid of and changed the a model quite a bit with Michaela. Michaela made lots of creative choices there. Uh, and this is Melissa's Chicken of the Woods, which I love that name, Chicken of the Woods. It has mushroom legs. And this is the final work. I will just play a really fast version of it because, again, it's four minutes long. <laughs> so I'll show you a really quick version of it. To give you an idea, these are all the characters. There's nine characters in total. So you can see that's on the side of Cadman's Cottage, which is in the rocks. Uh, and here is a version with the crowd interaction. So activating. So I just wanted to end my talk to, by just talking about the works as a whole. And so people that we've live, living with disability are often exhibited and funded within, within a disability context. So it was important to show the work created to a wider audience, which is what happened with Crowded Cadman's uh, 
So the first project we were asked to exhibit within an accessibility area um, with fellow artists with disability, which is great. But one of the goals for the artists was that they wanted to be uh, displayed more centrally amongst more neurotypical artists. So Erin Manning says in always more than one individuations dance, and I quote, what neurodiversity teaches us, it seems to me, are techniques to becoming attuned to this more than to become attuned to the inevitable amodality of experience that activates the contours of the event towards a moving and encountering a being moved in a complex ecology of practices, unquote. So this whole project for me, uh, working with the artists, was not just the ecology of processes and methodologies, but also towards a movement, a coming together of worlds and bodies. And as Menning calls it, a body is event, a collusion here as a force of agreement and attunement. So the project involved quite a few different ways of being, thinking about capabilities as a priority rather than limitations, working with the artists to ensure their vision was met and liaising with students and other creatives, including the creative directors of Vivid. It was a complex dance and a movement of a complex ecology of practice. Jennifer Eisenhower, just looking and staring back, challenging ableism through disability performance, argues engagement with the disability arts movement is one way to shift the focus from individual functional limitations towards acknowledgements of the important cultural contributions people with a disability can make as individuals. So instead of oppressive representations of disability upheld in our culture, the works are an alternative to ways of seeing, thinking and talking about disability. These projects are disruptive activation. This creates subversive narratives of disability through the process of educating the wider public, displaying and representing disability arts within formal institutions such as Vivid. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. That is just so interesting and so cool. I was very happy that I had the opportunity to get a preview of the Cadman's um, Cottage this year. And I have to say that from my balcony, I can see the ICC vivid things when they're happening. So you were my scenery for a little while, a couple of, couple of years ago. Thanks, Terry. <laughs> okay, moving along. Next, I would like to introduce Veronica Jiang, who's a senior lecturer at the School of Marketing, UNS Business School. She is a UNSW disability champion. She advocates for disability enthusiastically, and I know this from personal experience, having worked with Veronica a bit. She's going to talk about her project that was co-produced with people with disability, they produced several virtual reality videos that tell authentic life stories of a woman using a wheelchair. Thank you, Veronica, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I should close the subtitle on slides, right? Because we have the subtitle here uh, in the Zoom. Okay, let me try to share my screen. Um, Share sound. Cool. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. You're right. not quite in presentation mode, though. You're in. I'm not in presentation mode. OK, let me try again. Um, stop sharing. And let's see. Is this in presentation mode? That's perfect, yes. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I really appreciate that uh, Terry invited me to this um, education uh, event, an inclusive education event. I'm excited to share with you my project, Harnessing Virtual Reality for Disability Advocacy. And I want to first acknowledge um, I'm on the Kamariga and uh, Kuriga people's land. I'm in the Lankov area. I also want to extend my res respect to Aboriginal or Torres Strait Island people here today. So a little bit about the people with disability in Australia. Around 4.4 4 million Australians, they have disabilities. That's 17.7% of the population. Um, 
similar percentage among males among, uh, and among males and females, still around 17.7%. The next question related to these statistics is what do you think is the percentage of captures with disability has been represented in popular films? So if you can, you can type you guesses in the chat box and say what's the percentage of captures with disability that has been shown in popular films. Anyone want to type your percentage? 0.5, 2%. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, you're about a little bit right. Um, 0.5 is too low. <laughs> so actually there's a research about this. Um, it is the research is done by USC, Anna Burke, and it, Look at the top 100, uh, top 100 selling films in the United States from 2007 to 2019. 2.3% 2 of all speaking characters across these popular films, they have the characters with disabilities. And there's no meaningful changes uh, from 2015 to 2019. And the majority of the characters with disability were male, white, and over 40 years old. Um, so you can say that people with disability, they in popular culture, they are underrepresented and their stories are not well told or well heard. And uh, there's also the same a bunch of researchers that look at the Netflix uh, TV series and movies. Around 2.1% of, of all speaking characters were shown with a disability. In the film is a little bit better. So 11.9%, they have leads and co-leads were depicted with disability. So Netflix is doing a little bit better than the popular films, but still uh, much, much lower than the population wise. Right, so in the US, and it's still similar, around 20% of the population, they have disabilities. So in Australia, that's 17%. So the people with disability, their stories are less heard. And often that for people with disability, um, they are sometimes disfigured in the mass media. And they also assume the medical model of disability. In our pre previous presenters also talk about the social model of disability. Um, and the other side is the medical model of disability, which is quite pre prevalent in the society. So medical model of society means that disability is viewed as an illness and it's a medical condition and it should be fixed and it is not good. No wonder why the people with disability, they are misunderstood and their stories are not heard and their uh, negative scheme, um, stigma and prejudice against them. So this project, we're trying to tell the story from the people with disabilities point of view. Uh, like most of the presenters we have been doing in this event. And we interviewed 23 people with disabilities and we follow the social model of disability. So opposite to medical model of disability, social model of disability is understood disability as a social, as a social disadvantage or social oppression because people they face societies does not cater to their uh, impairment of body or mind. For example, here uh, in our event, we use live captions, we use Auslan interpreters. So all these help to make our event inclusive. If we don't use these tools, right? So um, a lot of folks with disability will cannot engage with our event or content. So that's why, if our society improve in terms of accessibility 
in conclusion, and the disability itself is not disabling. Um, is that a society disabling people because we don't provide accessible uh, format of informational content or engagement? So, uh, based on these thinking, so with the mm, with social model of disability in mind, we write a script from the quantitative qualitative data from these 20, 23 interviews. And I will also consult um, script writers with disability. They help us rewrite our script and make our script much better to represent views from the people with disabilities perspective. And then we film the virtual reality videos. We also write two versions of the script. So one is the questionable treatment version. That is that people with disability, they tell us the negative uh, social encounters or the negative prejudice they have experienced there in their daily life. We also ask them, um, how would you like to be treated? So that forms respectable treatment version. So they tell us that what would be a good way to interact with them, what would be a better way to feel, make them feel respected. And I will come back to like why we have different versions at the end. So with this, our project kind of co-produced the virtual reality videos with a woman using wheelchair. It tells the story of her, of a girl using wheelchair, going to a cafe, catching up with her friend. And we have different versions. There's, a, as we said, we have questionable treatment version and we have the respectable treatment version. We have the first person perspective and the third person perspective. And we also have the interactive virtual reality version. And the direct, uh, the UNSW media team help us film this um, project. This is the happy film crew and uh, uh, in the middle, you can see it's um, the main character, Amy, in the film, and she is very happy that uh, this whole story is around her. And this is in the JG Cafe, <laughs> as many of you can recognize. However, it is closed, unfortunately. And I would like to show you some segments of my video. Did you get here okay? Yeah, fine. Mommy, what's wrong with that lady's legs? Shh, come here. It's rude to stare. Sorry, hon. What a shame. I'm more than happy to answer questions from kids. You know how I'm always telling you not to run on the road because you'll get hit by a car? Well, if you do, you'll end up in a wheelchair, just like that lady. Excuse me? I was born this way. It just happens sometimes that there are a lot of different reasons for people using a wheelchair. I love my wheelchair because it helps me get around and I can do things for myself. Table for two? Yeah, yes, thanks. thanks. Sure. See if I can find a big enough table. You guys will need the extra space. There'll be a bit of a wait. Table for two? Awesome, just right this way. So obviously this is the uh, questionable treatment um, version. So I would like to, can everyone can uh, say and hear the video okay? And uh, I would like to show you another version. So this is the better way of treatment and uh, you can see the difference. Hey, did you get here okay? Yeah, fine. Mommy, what's wrong with that lady's legs? Sorry. Oh, darling, there's nothing wrong with that lady's legs. She just uses the wheelchair to help herself get around, just like your auntie uses the walking stick. 
Oh, okay. And if you go ask her politely, she might just tell you a bit about it. Excuse me, may I ask about your legs, please? Of course. It just so happens that there are a lot of different reasons for people using a wheelchair. I love my wheelchair because it helps me get around and I can do things myself. Table for two? Yes, thanks. Sure. Do you mind if you wait a little while just so we can find a table with some extra space? Not at all. It'll be about ten minutes if that's okay. Fine. Awesome. Right here. Here you go. Okay, so I don't want to show you the full thing uh, because I'm going to invite you to experience the virtual reality video version. And uh, from the um, we are showcase this virtual reality version tomorrow at the at the same diversity fest. So I would like to uh, type in the register link for everyone who is interested, who might be interested in looking at the virtual reality video version. And uh, there are um, it is it is run from ten o'clock to five o'clock. There are multiple time slots available, so please log in to the register page. It's free, and check out if there are any of the uh, time slot that suits your schedule. So come to visit us tomorrow, and it is in the um, Sainsha building. Yeah, it is in the Sainsha building. So it is in the register page. Please say that I would like to see you tomorrow, and you will like you can experience that full uh, VR video version and tomorrow. And another good news is that we submit this 2D version to the Focus on Ability Short Film Festival, and lucky enough we got the uh, nominated for best short film, and that's top five from 281 submissions. Although we didn't get to the top, uh, but we still uh, satisfy enough and uh, celebrate this achievement that will be nominated for the being the best um, short film in this festival. So for the next step for this, uh, this piece of work, um, I'm very glad that the introduction to special education, the course, they used these videos um, in the course, trying to generate conversations on equity and inclusion in learning. We also want to use this in disability confidence training, SDG courses, disability education courses. And we want to seek other opportunities to include these VR videos as educational materials or other purposes or for exhibitions, for example. Um, so anyone, if you can help, please let me know and contact me. And as for um, this research is also can be used as um, uh, part of the research. So there are different ways that we can uh, look at this project as a research. First of all, remember that we interviewed 23 people with disabilities. So we'll write that um, 23, we use that interview data to write a, a qualitative paper and uh, it has been conditionally accepted at disability and the society. we also, the, the process of making this virtual reality video and um, uh, the PhD student, she's writing a paper on action design research. Um, it's from um, information system perspective. It will be related to information system research journal, submit to that perspective. And also I showed you, there are different versions of the videos, right? So we have the questionable, treatment version, respectable treatment version, and we want to compare like the effectiveness of different versions. Is that in terms of disability advocacy, um, is the questionable treatment version is more persuasive or respectable version is more persuasive? And also how do you compare the first person perspective versus third person perspective? And I want you to experience that in the virtual reality event tomorrow. Okay, that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much. And I would like to stop sharing.
Thank you so much, Veronica. And to everybody else, I've actually had the fantastic opportunity to experience those VR movies myself. And I highly recommend if you can find the time to get over there, it won't take too long, but it's very well worth it. And thanks for sharing that with us. I think those videos are going to be very useful and wonderful as to advocate for our university and beyond. All righty. Last, but definitely not by any stretch least, I would like to interview May Lim and Ian Skinner. May is a chemical engineer who specializes in the design of advanced materials that exhibit useful properties at the nano length scale. She teaches in the chemical engineering program at the School of Chemical Engineering. She's also a fellow of the UNSW Scientia Education Academy, a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy, and the 2020 recipient of the Faculty of Engineering Education Innovation Fellow. Ian Skinner is an honorary staff member in engineering. He retired at the end of 2020 after 28 years teaching professional ethics, amongst other topics and was a sometime associate dean, sat on the academic board for nine years and chaired innumerable committees. He now spends time mentoring less experienced academics. As he says, after all, giving advice to the younger is the prerogative of the elder and has a very part-time role at Moreland College, Sydney's Baptist Church Seminary. Mary, May and Ian are going to discuss how they bring equity, diversity and inclusion concepts into engineering courses in a safe manner illustrated by three case studies on gender, cultural diversity, and disability. So thank you both for being here today. Thanks, Terry. <clears throat> Ian, I think you're there. I just can't see your video. And I apologize if I sound a bit crocky. Uh, my voice has gone funny. So if I start coughing, Ian's going to take over. Um, so what I might do is I'm going to share my slides, and I'm going to give part of it, and Ian's going to then continue the second part of it, and we're going to tag teams. Um, Ian, if you just say next, I'll press the next button. Would that work? Yep. Okay, and let me work out how this works. Share screen. Do you want me to share mine, mate? Uh, I think mine's working. Okay. If not, then I'll ask you to share. Because I'm not a Zoom user and I think it's not working. We're not seeing it, May. Okay. Yeah, maybe you 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 <laughs> you drive. <laughs> Does that work better? Yes, better. We can it's see easier because I can also see the uh, videos. Awesome. Okay, maybe I'll start and then I'll pass on to Ian uh, when he gets to his part. Uh, thank you, everyone. So today our talk is on student-centered approach to teaching EDI principle in engineering courses. Um, next slide. <clears throat> um, so why do we want to bring EDI principles into engineering courses? Um, very quickly, uh, engineers uh, build oops. design. Oops. Yep. Sorry. Build design. Uh, create. Write. Write codes for. Um, a lot of um, objects that or um, that we use, and um, something to also think about is engineers tend to be quite a homogeneous monocultural cohort. So we're trying to think about how do we bring um, some of these EDI principles into these courses um, through. If you go to the next slide, <clears throat> three case studies: uh, case study one, two, and three where we touch on uh, gender diversity, um, um, diversity by so cultural diversity, uh, as well as disability. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the first one we will look at is case study, which I'll pass to Ian, because this is the work Ian did um, about so, three years ago at the School of Electrical Engineering. So, so our, our <laughs> first exercise was to, uh, that we'll explain here is, is looking at unconscious bias and we gave the students a little exercise where they had to select a team the students had to choose and rank a new team member and they were given four profiles and half the class were given de-identified applicants this is the classic exercise and the other half were given named applicants 
And they completed this ranking individually before class. Moodle offers wonderful facilities for doing this. Then when they got to class, the teacher released the collective votes, the overall votes of the class. Um, and this led to a discussion because almost invariably we had something wonderful to talk about in the concept of bias. Let me give you an example. This, this was, well, I can't remember which year this was, but this was the year four um, local male Wednesday students. And you see the blind applicants, they clearly wanted applicant C. And yet once they were revealed to them that applicant C was Charlotte in the named cases, um, they weren't so keen on getting Charlotte in their team. And the comments that came with the selection was quite revealing. The good things about this exercise is that the students knew they were talking about themselves. They hadn't been told, look, we've got to talk about this because they were confronted with a problem that they had generated from their own choices and behaviour. Um, <clears throat> they could see that their own choices hadn't delivered equity inclu inclusion here. So it wasn't a top down, it was rather a, a bottom up exercise of self discovery. Um, it's a by facilitating a reflection in the class, the students are able to, to construct their own meaning of what's going on here. And no individual student, of course, was identified. So there was no requirement for any student to admit that they personally were biased, but they could see that collectively their decisions were biased. Um, and so it was kind of like a shared responsibility that came through much more easily to talk about. The challenges of this one, well, it only works if students are willing to, to talk about feelings. Sometimes when the collective choice was revealed, the room was just stunned silence, um, particularly if, if there weren't any uh, young women in the class to balance all of those young men. Uh, they were a little less likely to want to talk about it in depth and it was harder work for the tutor. Um, <clears throat> it's not easy to measure what students have learnt from this. Their, their awareness has certainly improved, but whether, of course, it makes any difference down the track, you never know. And the problem with unconscious bias is obviously it's unconscious, it's, it's hidden. So it's, um, it's a little bit difficult to know what's, what's changed uh, back to, to, to you, Mai. You're muted, Mai. Sorry. Uh, so the second uh, case study is we are looking into teamwork, so multicultural uh, teams, diverse multicultural teams. So we assign uh, students to diverse teams using their demographic profile, a uh, bit of their academy achievements and goal, personality trait, and so it's a bit about their preference and belief system. Uh, next slide. And what the student found was working in a diverse team, uh, although you could get more productivity, it is actually, uh, if you click, it's much harder. Uh, next slide. And the reason is uh, diversity actually do make collaboration more challenging. And what we found was uh, the student uh, needed support on how to engage with each other. Next slide. Uh, when we poll the student before we start uh, the activity, uh, only 28% of them uh, refers to they will need some skills on teamwork in order to do the activity, even though the activity was explicitly teamwork. And 0% refers to uh, needing skill for working in a diverse team. So our students are not even aware that those skills are required in order to work together. So uh, some of the key um, gaps we found was there's a lack of cultural awareness among the students, uh, particularly uh, around communication between our native and English as second language speakers. And there's a loss of a lack of inclusion skill. Uh, the students just do not know how do you engage with the others. And I say others here with a capital O. Uh, next slide. Uh, the comments from the students are along the line of, it would be great if you know, there's more resources and training about how to build a cultural sensitive teams before the group work assignment. Uh, next slide. But there is also benefit. Uh, the student did say that they found uh, working in a diverse team more rewarding. Uh, next slide. This is a really long read. Um, 
but what the students found is they, they learned a lot in the course by doing this sort of teamwork. Um, among other things is um, here the students, um, one, this is actually an international student where in a previous course, she was put together with four other international students. And she actually found a dime with someone who's like me, I end up doing all the work myself. But in this particular term or in this course, I was putting people who are different from me. And it's, as a result, I actually have to put on more effort to engage with them. And as a result, I end up um, working more effectively and more efficiently. Uh, next slide. Yep. Uh, now we go to the next case study, which I'll pass on back to Ian. Yeah, so our third hmm. little story was um, reflected on, on the, the, uh, the need to design things for engineering. And we thought, wouldn't it be nice if students would want to be in diverse teams instead of seeking to avoid being in a diverse team? And so we thought, how can we make this happen? So, first, here you are. Just wake you all up again. It's, it's getting on to, to half past 10. There's, there's a couple of artifacts there. On the left, you've got a hand dryer. So I mentioned the noise of hand dryers earlier today. Um, there's another problem there with the hand dryer. And then, of course, you've got the railway barriers there on the other side of the screen. Does anybody want to venture what's the shared inclusion design failure? No one, no one wants to, to be brave enough to have a go. Something's popped up in the chat. Let's see what it says. It says, um, narrow turnstiles, the noise. Um, that's not a common, the, the, the narrow turnstiles is a design failure on one side, and that's why you've got the wide gate. Uh, the noise is, is a problem on the other side, but again, it's not a common for the two of them. It's not sensitive to, they would find it uncomfortable. I'm not sure. Okay, okay. one's too high and the other's too height. Um, not sure that the height's a problem on the gate. I, I'd be open to that explanation. All right, let, let me tell you what eventually came out of the class. Um, I'll come back to the right window here. They're both unfair to left-handed people. Now, a lot of features are in engineering. Um, we have to design hand tools specifically for left-handed or right-handed people, or we have to keep hand tools available. Um, <clears throat> and it's something that engineers need to think about. And left-handedness is, is part of the, the human diversity, but it's very rarely mentioned. Uh, it's around about 10% of the population, depending upon which subpopulation you're looking at. So we play a simulation game and the teams had to cut out and trade paper shapes. But what I, I did as a wrinkle was to only give the teams left-handed scissors. And it was, it's always an extraordinarily interesting exercise to only hand out left-handed scissors to a normal class. The outcomes, students met reality. If all the team members have the same ability, that is if they're all right-handed, it is less resilient in the face of a random challenge. The students learned that it was, they were then far more open to discussing inclusion principles because they recognized the value of having a diverse team member. Uh, they were also, the, the discussion led to the react, working out that it cost extra money to keep tools for left handed and right handed people in the workshop. Um, and this is the inevitable trade off in terms of a utilitarian approach. Now, the good things is that because it's not discussed, anywhere else, left-handedness doesn't get the same instant eye roll that the classic diversity criteria achieve with 22-year-old room full of males. Um, and I was one of them once, so I, I could sympathize with, with it. Left-handedness cuts across all of the other diversity categories. And so you don't get the, the normal sort of socio-political controversies in the classroom that that are best avoided. Um, it has direct workplace relevance to engineering students, so they, they can't pretend that it doesn't matter. 
and it's it's a very easy opening then to talk about inclusiveness of other other people in their interpersonal behaviors and teamwork because um the good thing about these activities is that you can make these experiential arguments about things very successfully and while engineers love utilitarian arguments some people might not appreciate utilitarian motivation for including diverse people they, they might prefer a virtue argument that's a little bit harder to simulate in the classroom um, the, the learning has come from the student's own experience so once again they've constructed a meaning out of this and we uh, debrief them, we're able to see this. The challenge is, of course, simply evaluating somebody for their functional worth and merit is not the best motivation for including people, but it's, it's better, than, you know, it's a starting point. And the other, the other interesting challenge is the impact of left-handed only on some of the right-handed students. And I was not expecting or prepared for this. Um, some students were very confused about receiving tools that they could not use, but as a four-year-old, they knew they had learned how to use them. It's, that's something that, that needs better supporting. Um, why do we do things this way? Because the students make their own thing. The whole of these exercises, because they're things that have come out of the class, it's a journey of self-discovery. So I don't come in with a prepared agenda. Well, I can because I know exactly how it will play out, but Theoretically, the students could do something completely different. And of course, the class would have to be played out entirely different. What do we learn from this? We learn that there are lots of limitations on what we can do. Uh, in particular, being engineering lecturers, there's a significant limitation on the challenge for us as teachers, uh, not having the expertise to take this to a much deeper level. And of course, there's always that problem that, that the course time is limited. So how much of this you, you can do is, is always limited. Uh, I think that's the end, May. Yep. Thank you both very, very much. Um, it's so good to see what other people are doing. It really is. It inspires me to do better in my own practice. So thank you both very much. Now we have time left over for some questions. Um, I believe all of our speakers are still here, except for Ian, who had to run. But Aaron and I are here to answer any questions that you have about diversity. So you can either raise your hand to ask questions, or you can put questions in the chat. OK, here's one question that we got. If you could name a few top priorities requirements or interventions for UNSW learning and research spaces, what would they be? Um, and I am guessing that that question is probably most directed to Scott, since he was really working on the spaces. Um, yeah, great question. Um, I think the preparation and predictability was one that came up a lot. So what Autism Friendly were describing as the hidden curriculum. So um, it is a little bit of a stereotype, but autistic people are often um, overwhelmed by a lot of new information and um, respond really well to clear instructions. So if we can make sure that, that there's systems in place that that outline the expectations of people, um, anything like safety issues in a very clear, easy read format. All of those steps, um, I think, reduce, I guess, the cognitive load of people who are new to spaces, um, reduce anxiety around what am I supposed to be doing here, and just allow people to get on with what it, what it is they're actually here to do, whether they're students or researchers or staff. Um, so that's probably where I'm finding in this particular project where focusing a lot of our attention is, is making sure that um, those expectations are laid out in a really clear, easy to understand way. And, and they're different depending on each different space. So they have 
different requirements. But um, yeah, that's probably the main one I would I would note. Thank you. And Ian, I see your hands up, but I'm going to jump in because I've been waiting to ask Scott this question. Um, are there plans, are you working with anybody to make some of those same improvements on main campus? And I understand that that is a mammoth undertaking compared to the space that you have at the Paddington campus. It is. Um, but that is a conversation that we're having. I think Paddington was a great place to start because it is an excellent case study and a manageable, manageable space to put these things into place and say, here's, here's what we can do. It's not it's not about starting from scratch or putting huge uh, resources and money and, and stuff in, in, in and a lot of what we're doing is already here. It's just being arranged in slightly different ways. So I think if we can show Paddington as a good example of, of best practice, then um, I think it makes the transition to main campus a little easier. That is definitely on the agenda. Um, I, what I think may happen there, though, is it will be a faculty by faculty discussion. So Kensington as one job is it, it's too big, <laughs> is the short yeah. answer. And I think faculties are probably going to buy into this individually. The problem with that is we end up being so siloed when we do things that way. But that's just my own personal little gripe. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and let Ian ask his question. Thank you for being patient, Ian. Uh, my, my question is to both Scott and to Aaron. You, you've talked a little bit, each of you, about uh, supporting neurodiverse students. And you, you've hinted a little bit at supporting neurodiverse staff. I'd just like to, to get a little bit more from you on, on initiatives that are in place to try and support some of our neurodiverse teaching staff. Um, I've got a few thoughts on that. I mean, it's not it's not something that we explicitly have looked at in in the project that I'm working on. But as Terry noted, I think with a lot of this work, even though you may be focusing on on students or e even just neurodiversity, it makes things more accessible for everybody. Um, so there's no reason that staff couldn't be using the quiet spaces, couldn't be taking advantage of um better wayfinding all of those sorts of things um it, it's something that i'd be really interested in chatting with neurodiverse staff about like what are the specific needs in that space and how are they different from students um but yeah that said i, I think they can definitely benefit from what is being put in place through this project and the diversified project as a neurodiverse staff member, I was very excited about a lot of the things you talked about, Scott, because I would find them helpful. Right. Um, the other thing that I thought of was since everything's um, so much online, probably more so at main campus than at Paddington, I think you guys have so many workspaces and things where people are in person, that Sunflower training would be amazing if it was open to um, staff at main campus, but also maybe digital badges so we can recognize those students in our online classes also and they can recognize us. More of a comment than a, than a question. Okay, we've got another question. How can you promote and enable inclusive education and take care of yourself in a fast-paced and ever-changing environment? Um, I think it becomes, and any of the presenters can jump in here, but I think for me, it becomes part of your practice. It's just, once you start doing it, it's just what you do. I've designed my courses using the pillars of universal design for learning, and I'm going to include that inclusion statement that Scott talked about, because I thought that was a fabulous idea to let people know without even wearing a badge. But um, I think taking care of ourselves is just, it's an issue in general in academia. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? Karen? I think it's about working with people that understand what you're dealing with. And I think that really helps. I think finding your people, I think that's, that's what really helps me, I can say. 
Agreed. And I think uh, with the universal design of learning, that's quite helpful. And as Terry suggested, so we can try to promote the UDL uh, to more staff and uh, have more staff to consider it to integrate into their practice and the teaching. So that could be laid down at the end of the year or at the beginning of next year because that's where staff have a little bit of a break and they have a think about what would they do for the next year or for the next course design. And I also usually encourage staff not to try to change everything all at once and make sure everything's all universal design because that will not contribute to your well-being. That will stress you out. <laughs> um, I think if you look, if you look at our UDL guidelines, just kind of a checklist in the back, you'll see that you're already doing a lot of it. It's good teaching, but I always strive to add at least one or two things every term. So I'm building my UDL practice as I go without making it some huge boulder that I'm trying to lift up and carry around with everything else I'm doing. It's just about doing that, improving your practice as we all should be doing naturally anyway. Aaron says, we didn't get the chance to focus too much on the neurodiversity, neurodivergent staff, but I think it would be great next approach for the project to look into. Start small, keep it simple, May says, yes, absolutely. And I think attending these things, I, I truly feel like they're inspirational. I also feel like when I look at the people that are here, we're preaching to the converted all the time, but. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Maybe early marks for long showcases are also a way to stay healthy. <laughs> okay, everybody, thank you so much for coming today. I really appreciate you being here and I appreciate the speakers so much. I'd like to thank you all again and give you a hand. Um, such great work being done across campus. So many great ideas. I feel invigorated and I'm hoping you do too. Have a great rest of Diversity Week. <laughs>